we invite you to join us this Sunday and every Sunday morning to hear the word of our Lord as it is proclaimed. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. The text for this morning is written in James chapter 2, verses 10 to 15. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that saith, Do not commit adultery, also saith, Do not kill. Now if thou commit adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and do you, that they should be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy, and mercy receiveth against judgment. What does it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he have faith and have not works, can faith say him? If a brother or a sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needed to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. So far the text. My dear friends, St. James says, faith without works is dead. St. Paul says, now we conclude that a man is saved by grace without the works of the law. Now who's right? Well, they both are. James would never contradict the fundamental teaching of scripture that we're saved by grace. This grand fundamental truth of the Bible that has the promise of heaven is backed by Almighty God and can't change. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but not a single syllable of the gospel shall change. You and I find it so precious that every Sunday we hear, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it, and again, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. And so if it's true that faith without works is dead, then we must construe these words in such a way that they do not in any way challenge the basis of our faith. If a man wants to be saved by works, well, then he's going to have to keep all the Ten Commands perfectly. And no descendant of Adam has ever been able to do that. You and I can't keep the commandments. And to make that point, St. Paul or St. James used two commandments. The Fifth Commandment and the Sixth Commandment, actually, he needed only one. The Fifth Commandment not only condemns murder, but it tells you that if you talk about your brother behind his back or you want to bring him down or you think yourself so much better than he is, you're guilty of murder in the eyes of God. And that's true of the Sixth Commandment. Jesus says, as you as much as look at a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart. And no heart is so pure that we're free from the allurements of the devil. Sin begins in the heart. One single violation of God's law makes you guilty of all. As the text opened and said, whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. And if somebody is so self-righteous that he feels, you know, if I try hard to keep the commandments, well, God will be pleased. Well, God never rewards anybody for trying hard, even though there's a world of people who believe that. The holy and righteous God demands perfection. It's either or. Either you keep his commandments or you don't. 
And even if hypothetically you could keep every one of the commandments, yet Jesus says you're still an unworthy servant because you're only doing that which you're supposed to do. Here's what he said. When you have done all those things that are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants because we've only done that which was our duty to do. So then, based on works, no one can be saved. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And on that truth, all the apostles are agreed, whether it's Peter or Paul or James. We're saved purely by faith in the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord. And that's confirmed in the scripture where we read, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Well, if St. James says, faith without works is dead, he's telling us that a living faith always shows itself in works. That all the things you think or say or do are governed by the perfect law of liberty. And that law of liberty is in direct contrast to the law of God, which only gives slavery. The Ten Commandments are never any comfort. It doesn't make you feel good to come to church Sunday after Sunday and be told that you're sinful and unclean and that you sin against him by thought, word, and deed. It doesn't make us feel good to be told that naturally we're very proud and self-righteous. The Ten Commandments in no way can give liberty, but instead they only give guilt. They cause resentment, and they make sin more sinful. So if there's a law that gives liberty, then that law has to be based on the gospel with the emphasis on the liberty that it gives. With the free conscience that we have through the forgiveness of our sins and with the delight that we have in showing our faith in our lives. Think about that for just a moment. The law of liberty sets you free to express your faith. A child of God isn't forced to be kind and loving. A Christian husband and wife aren't forced to love each other. A Christian man isn't forced to go about his work faithfully and honestly. None of us are forced to put the will of God first in our lives. Everything a Christian does, he does not because he has to, but because he wants to. And if some kindness is squeezed out of you by force. It's worthless in the eyes of God because it doesn't come from the heart. The Lord wants us to love him because he first loved us. He wants us to love him because his son did for us what we cannot do by ourselves, by forgiving our sins and by giving us the strength to let our faith show in the things we do. So that, as the scriptures say, that with good and honest hearts, having heard the word, we might bring forth fruit with patience. The works of a Christian throughout scripture are called fruit. A good tree brings forth good fruit, and a tree without fruit is hewn down as Jesus made clear in the parable of the fig tree, where he, the master of the vineyard said to the dresser, I've been looking for fruit for the last three years in the tree, this tree and I haven't found it. Cut it down. It doesn't do any good in my garden. The fruit that Jesus is looking for in our lives is the, the fruit that comes from our hearts. And St. John made that clear when he talked to the scribes and Pharisees about their pretended religion. He said, and now the axe is laid under the root of the trees. 
And therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is cast, cut down and cast into the fire. No matter how good a tree looks, if it doesn't bear fruit, it's worthless. And St. James makes that clear with an interesting illustration in this text. He says, if a man says, I have faith, and then ignore the helping his brother and his neighbor with pious platitudes like, God bless you, depart in peace, be filled with warmth, and then refuses to lift a finger to help him, he says that man's faith is worthless. It's nothing but a sham. Every good tree is known by its fruit, says the Savior. And if you and I lived in a perfect world, and if we had perfect faith, we'd bring forth perfect fruit and love and joy and peace and long suffering and gentleness and goodness would be hanging on every branch. But the old Adam won't allow that to happen. Anger so quickly takes the place of love Unhappiness so quickly takes the place of joy, and irritability so easily takes the place of gentleness. And simply deploring the fact that we can't always bring forth good fruit isn't the answer. St. James points us to the scriptures, to the word of God, which tells us that the lack of fruit in our lives is really a lack of faith. Faith demands penitence. We need the word of God to remind us that our faith is nothing to brag about. We need the word of God to bring down our proud hearts so that we come to the Savior who is meek and lowly with meek and lowly hearts. We need the word of God to remind us of the wonderful thing that we have in forgiveness and we need the word of God to work out in our lives the faith that is in our hearts. And one final point. What you do out of faith without expecting a single reward is rewarded by God both in this life and in the life to come. And the psalmist David explained that so beautifully in his first psalm when he said that the man of God shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water who bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. They're like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. But the Lord knows the way of the righteous, and the way of the ungodly shall perish. Amen.